Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think we'll, um, we'll get going. Um, just to introduce myself and the panel, I'm Nick Bowles. I'm a newly minted member of parliament. And the only reason why I'm chairing this event, and I'm not really allowed to say this, is because the great Andrew Adonis, who is director of the Institute for Government, is living it up in a, in a posh conference in Venice. <laughs> me as a cheap substitute. Um, uh, I have a particular interest in this subject because before being elected, immediately before, I uh, ran something called the implementation team uh, for David Cameron, which was certainly the Conservative Party's first ever attempt in opposition to actually try and plan how to implement its policies rather than just focus on developing policy. Um, you will be the judges of how successful we were or weren't. We've got a great panel from all around the world. Um, immediately to my left, Ben Rimmer from Australia, who will be opening the event uh, with a presentation on how the Australian government has learned from and developed its own approaches to chasing up implementation and delivery. We have, uh, well, and now the order's quite wrong, we have Stan from the <laughs> Netherlands, uh, who's a senior advisor to the Dutch Prime Minister. We have Rebecca from New Zealand, who is um, secretary to the Cabinet um, and clerk of the Executive Council. Secretary to the Cabinet isn't quite the same role as Cabinet Secretary, um, but nevertheless, she has an absolutely pivotal role in chasing up the Prime Minister's priorities in New Zealand. Um, we have Chris, sorry, who I missed out, um, who used to work with me in the implementation team and is now taking all the flat running uh, the implementation side of the policy and implementation unit um, in government. Um, and then at the end, we have William from Canada, who is Deputy Secretary Plans and Consultation in the Privy Council Office um, in, 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 in the Prime Minister's Office in Canada. So um, we're going to start with uh, about 10 minutes from Ben, um, and then we'll open it up to the floor. Well, we'll initially take some comments from the panel and then open it up to the floor. Ben. Uh, thanks, thanks very much. And... Um, uh, it's a fantastic event and one of the things about being here is that you realise very quickly how, how central the Institute for Government has become and uh, certainly from an Australian perspective would quite like one. Uh, I don't know <laughs> how you arrange that but um, I'm, I'm <laughs> sure... <laughs> um, but, but seriously, thank you uh, to the Institute, uh, to LSE um, and to Chris for uh, I guess the original impetus behind the event. Um, it's, it's not exactly a high point in Australia-British uh, Australia relations right now. Um, uh, some of you may have seen uh, that The Economist published a special edition on Australia uh, a few weeks ago, uh, which, um, which attacked us for our dress sense, um, uh, which some of us kind of could tolerate. Then it went on to call our red wine decent but dependable, um, which to an Australian is pretty much... Um, well, it's very insulting, let's put it that way. <laughs> but um, uh, leaving the wonderfully imperious economist uh, to one side, um, uh, relations between our two countries are very good, and uh, it's always a pleasure to be here. Um, I guess my approach to the topic is as a practitioner um, and as a civil servant. Uh, and uh, in particular, for the last three years, uh, I've run the Strategic Policy and Implementation Group in the Prime Minister's Department in Australia. Um, it started in 2008 after a, a review of our central policy making functions uh, and it effectively um, joined together an existing cabinet implementation unit uh, and a new idea really for, from an Australian perspective of uh, creating a strategy function uh, in the centre of government. And obviously that built uh, heavily from a range of influences, including uh, the UK. Um, today, uh, there's a strategy division of um, around 40 people. Um, and uh, the cabinet implementation unit has morphed into an implementation division, which also has around uh, 30 or 40 people. Um, we largely focus on domestic policy. Uh, so uh, one of the shortcomings with my job title I've discovered is that when you talk to Americans, they think that because you do strategic policy um, that you will know how many nuclear warheads uh, North Korea has and those kinds of things. Uh, but I don't think that translation problem exists here. Um, three key roles as part of uh, my job. Um, the first is to help the Prime Minister and support the Prime Minister in her management of uh, the government's agenda and priorities. Um, and, and also uh, to uh, help her understand the progress of those priorities. Um, second job is uh, on the strategic policy front. Uh, we run 
uh, projects we get involved on issues. Uh, I, I tend to describe it as things that are more difficult, more co cross-cutting, more cross-jurisdictional in the Australian context, because we're a federation, uh, than the average difficult policy problem. Um, and uh, that's certainly been our history. We've done work on workforce participation. We've done work on the future of cities in Australia. Uh, we've done work on health reform, uh, which is kind of a, a forbidden topic tonight, I'm told. Um, uh, but we've done uh, other things as well. The third key role is around implementation. Uh, we do capability building work on implementation. Uh, we monitor um, progress of specific uh, issues and challenges. And uh, we also have a bit of a troubleshooting role in uh, circumstances where something is going wrong uh, or might be going wrong, uh, sometimes where uh, we're involved. What we don't do, uh, but which is, uh, it's very important in context, elsewhere in PM&C does, is um, uh, there is a, a strong central day-to-day -day policy coordination and, uh, and quality control function. And uh, that is a, a feature that um, we've had some pre-discussion, by the way. There was a bit of caucusing between the panel members. And, and what we've discovered is something that probably many of you know, which is that um, some of us share this uh, characteristic and, and some don't. Uh, in the Australian uh, context, there are about 100 people in the Prime Minister's department who, uh, in addition to my group, who provide advice on uh, the progress of day-to-day -day matters through Cabinet uh, and um, other day-to-day uh, -day management of policy issues on behalf of the Prime Minister. Um, these roles, uh, these three roles that I've described that I, I play uh, fit together and actually, uh, I mean, it sounds somewhat self-serving, but I think they fit together in a very important way. Um, uh, for example, we, uh, to, to be practical about it, we uh, recently, uh, in, in early May in the Australian uh, political calendar, there's a federal budget. Uh, and um, delivering a budget is obviously a fairly significant um, milestone in the year. And uh, so around that, we provided some advice to the Prime Minister about how her priorities were going uh, and where, if anywhere, uh, new work needed to be commissioned um, in order to better meet uh, her, her agenda. Now, some of that work was uh, work that was commissioned from ministers, some of, which, uh, some of the work was work that was already in existence, but we tweaked it a little or asked it to come back to Cabinet in a slightly different way. And some of that work uh, effectively became policy commissioning uh, for PM and C, uh, for the Prime Minister's department, and in, in particular for the strategy division within it. Um, obviously, all of this comes in a in a context with, which I think is uh, at least somewhat shared between the UK and Australia. Uh, fiscal challenges, obviously, more significant here than in Australia, but still significant in both places. Uh, increasing public expectations, increasing ambition of government, uh, and um, uh, certainly in an Australian context, increasing intolerance of uh, delivery failure and delivery risk. And all of that um, makes uh, being at the centre of government uh, and managing the centre of government, uh, in my view, a, a more challenging uh, place to be, a more challenging task than it has been for some time. Um, it's interesting, it's always very dangerous, by the way, to, um, to comment on other countries when you're visiting them. Uh, but it is interesting, um, as an outsider, uh, I haven't been in the UK for a year or so, and um, the, uh, there is uh, a real sense from talking to people of the scale of the challenge that's uh, about at the moment, the scale of the implementation uh, uh, risk and difficulties that's about at the moment, and um, the combination of those things with the uh, difficult fiscal circumstances and the cuts that follow that is, is very apparent when you visit this place uh, as an outsider. Um, and so I think makes this conversation uh, all the more important uh, uh, from my um, humble perspective as an Australian. Um, so five quick observations about uh, the role and the, and, the, and the job and about this debate. Firstly, I, I think it's sometimes mischaracterised as a debate about centralisation versus decentralisation. Uh, I believe uh, that uh, Prime Ministers need effective professional support at the centre of government, whether they intend to run a centralised government or a decentralised government. And in fact, um, much as when you have a decentralised approach to school education, 
you also need a capacity in the centre to monitor the performance of individual schools. Um, if you run a decentralised approach to cabinet government, uh, you also arguably need a, 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 um, a central capacity to monitor and uh, provide advice about the progress. Secondly, uh, it's also possible to mi mischaracterise this debate in uh, kind of black and white terms. Um, uh, but, but in my view, this isn't about formulas uh, or rules. Um, I, I sometimes describe uh, it as the very nuanced and careful application of central power um, as the, the nuanced and careful application of a high caliber um, automatic weapon. Um, because you can do a lot of harm from the center. Uh, you can do a lot of good from the centre and um, uh, the truth is the effective application of it is, is all about judgement and nuance. The third observation I'd, I'd make, uh, and, and I know this is at least somewhat controversial uh, here, is uh, that I think in my view and I think in, uh, in the view of uh, excessive Australian government, um, the, the provision of effective support to the Prime Minister uh, a lot across the roles that I've described um, is a core role of the civil service. It's a core role of a professional, uh, impartial uh, civil service that, uh, that builds up capacity and that survives from uh, government to government and, and year to year. Um, and, and therefore, I guess it becomes part of the institutions at the centre of government. Um, in a way that doesn't exist in all countries, and I freely admit that there are more than one, uh, there's more than one way to skin this particular cat. But, but from an Australian perspective, it's uh, that that is uh, increasingly a shared uh, view and shared belief from different perspectives. Um, fourth observation is the importance of having the right connections between service deliverers, implementers, and strategic policy thinkers. Uh, certainly when I was given the task of setting up a strategic policy capability uh, in Canberra, uh, the first thing I said was, yeah, but sure, I don't want it to be sitting off in an ivory tower, not connected to anything. And uh, we've tried to achieve that, and at some level we have achieved that, including by having the implementation capacity and the strategic capacity uh, so close together. Finally, and, and I guess uh, somewhat of a truism, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, one of the things that we both face is that uh, all of this at the end uh, is about uh, people and about human capability and about human capital. And certainly both, uh, well, let me speak for the Australian government rather than both governments. Um, certainly the Australian government uh, has some very real challenges in terms of attracting and retaining uh, the right kind of people to these, uh, these functions and indeed other functions at the centre of government. And so um, uh, there's, a lot, uh, there's a lot to be done on that side in order for the rest of it to, uh, to take its normal role. So finally, from me, um, you know, sometimes people say um, about um, British expats that um, they're kind of more British than Britain. Um, and uh, we sometimes feel at the moment like we're kind of more Westminster than Westminster in <laughs> some ways. Um, and. Uh, that, that was particularly true in some parts of the Blair-Brown era where cabinet processes in Australia were certainly more, um, well certainly from the external appearance it looked like they were more um, uh, formalised in Australia than they were here. Um, but it's also relevant I think to this discussion. Um, certainly in Australia uh, the approach to these issues is increasingly uh, systematic and institutional uh, as a core part of what um, uh, the civil service does in support of uh, the Prime Minister uh, and for that matter state premiers. Um, and uh, so uh, we certainly think it's an interesting, uh, an interesting uh, discussion and debate to be had among our colleague um, countries here in terms of the different roles that are played in different countries. Uh, so that's probably enough okay. from me um, as a starting point. but. Um, well, thank you very much, Jack. What I'm going to suggest is if we can go to the far end to William. Oh, sure. Just <laughs> <laughs> and then work our way back to Chris. Mm. Um, with it. Yeah. Yeah. That's the strategy. <laughs> First of all, thank you for the opportunity to be here. It is very interesting to see the different political circumstances, different uh, structures, and also the degree of commonality. So a couple of things about Canada by way of background. 
Uh, we just had an election which, uh, which delivered us from, uh, or, or uh, uh, saved us from seven years of minority government. So minority truly unstable government for the last seven years at the federal level, meaning that the planning horizon for a government was often about 45 to 90 days just because of series of confidence votes and no coalition agreement, none of that kind of structure. So uh, uh, we, we were uh, providing support to a government in, in that context. That put the focus on implementation and a clarity of focus around uh, uh, a ministry that's different. So we're now going to re-enter a period which has really been our standard of, of majority governments. We'll have a government until October 2015, uh, uh, over 2,000 more days uh, of that government. And that's a different way of, of uh, planning. It has been our norm. And in that context, that, that early focus, uh, the doldrums in the middle of the mandate, and then the, the re-electioneering kind of thing that most of us grew up with in the, in the public service will kind of return to and manage through. In a short-term uh, minority government, um, the focus on priorities and immediate delivery, the urgency of issues, and the collapsing of issues management, media management, communication, um, has, has really been witnessed, uh, I think, in, in the recent period. So you'll see a government that was very focused on communicating a message, very focused on responding very quickly to issues as they emerge, uh, and, and effective in, in some ways in response to the crisis. We, we have gone into and come out of the economic crisis better than most in the G7. We've got to quit bragging about it in a way, but we mobilized quite effectively to collapse our cabinet decision-making process, to bolster existing programs, to try to make sure that we were delivering out in, in the communities and getting stimulus on the ground in a, in a way that was, uh, that was effective. We responded to an earthquake in, in Haiti, in BC Americans, to, to Haiti. We had troops on the ground and emergency relief in place uh, within 24 hours of the earthquake actually happening, which is something we're, uh, we're very proud of. And that focus on delivery and decision making and collapsing it can all, can all work well. Our structure is very similar to the Australian structure. So I work in a group that supports the Prime Minister. There's about 20 of us on the public service side whose full time job is support the Prime Minister's uh, strategy, macroeconomic advice support to the core uh, cabinet committee. That's kind of all that, that we do in strategic advice on communication. Uh, there's about 100, 120, depending on how one counts, that support the other cabinet committees in quality assurance, in working with our, our other central agencies and working with departments to ensure that as matters are going through cabinets, they're the right matters, they've been subjected to the right kind of coordination and challenge, that we're going to have a, a fruitful cabinet uh, discussion. And then when it comes to the prime minister's table, the table has been as well set as any group of individuals with competing interests and demands and structures and viewpoints and all those things can ever, uh, can ever accomplish. So it's not perfect, but it provides that level of integration and support. The other interesting thing from the, I think from the Canadian perspective commenting on this is that we have a sort of a, a divided process where our finance and our treasury board are divided. Cabinet approval for the policy and the direction and the, the notional envelope that's allocated to a project or a proposal is all well and good, but you've got nothing until you've got treasury board approval, who have a group of soulless analysts who will pour over the details <laughs> of your strategy, look into the entrails of your department and say, actually, you're doing a bit of that over there and a bit of that over there, and we actually think those two things should be collapsed and all done here, because this is going to be a better, a better way of, of implementing the program. They're going to hold the senior civil service accountable for how well they manage the structure. Uh, and uh, whether they've got an operating management framework that is managing people risk, policy risk, stakeholder relations, values and ethics, all of those kinds of things. And that's applied directly to the senior public service and made public in terms of how well we're doing. So for ministers to come in with a proposal through cabinet and get it approved is all well and good. They still have to get to spend any money and get the authority to spend the approval of our treasury. We work very closely with our finance department on whether we've got any of this cash and whether we're doing the right things in the economy and with our treasury board to make sure that government is spending it well, that we're following up on regular intervals to evaluate success, and to look, as they say, into the entrails of departments and draw out the other similar things that three departments are doing and to ask those hard questions that sometimes will not get dealt with around the cabinet table uh, at the main cabinet, uh, to be able to sort of drive some of that, uh, that rigor through the system. That too is not perfect. There's lots of things in big departments that are going on and it's hard, it's hard to keep up with. But that sort of triangular relationship between finance, the Privy Council office, and support by Prime Minister and Treasury Board has proven at least to be a series of checks and balances. Along the way, one can catch a number of things in the system, and you can kind of track, uh, um, track implementation. We're also like Australia, federal, state, and so implementation of many things now 
gets to be a very difficult thing to track because of the number of hands that are on the, uh, on the tiller at any one point and the way in which so much is shared. We just had an election. Following an election, we have a tradition of our prime minister sending out to each of his ministers a mandate letter that tasks them and says, okay, we're organized around a series of core priorities, and in your department, that means. And fully half of those task lists right now involve, and you're going to work in collaboration with, and you're going to cooperate with, and that matrix is now becoming uh, quite a little complicated beast to pull together to make sure you've got the right horizontal uh, work going on in government. And then add to that the external stakeholders that a minister or ministry department have to work with. So it is becoming, in that sense, working at the center, more of a complicated uh, task, I think, of orchestration, of applying the right tools in the most gentle and loving way as, uh, as is possible when, uh, when you're trying to uh, uh, keep a government on court, uh, make sure that things are being implemented, anticipate and, and respond to problems as they emerge in a 24-7 news cycle where the urge to respond is, is very rapid and can be very overwhelming, and where issues, in our experience, can grow very rapidly. It used to take a while for issues to perk out there, and with social media now, we found that our, our issues are, are perking and coming to a boil at a point where we're having a great difficulty keeping up with it, and, and even being able to advise the government about how to respond, let alone having the time to think about it. So I think that is a challenge that we will all share in this. That, thank you very much. I, I, you could say there's a, a perfect description of the difference between Australia and Canada. We had a semi diplomatic record and we had gentle and loving care. <laughs> <laughs> um, Rebecca and Stan, I think that's just perhaps the, the, the differences, the divergences in your system from, from some of the similarities that we've heard from. I think um, one of the key things about the New Zealand system. Um, in terms of differences, because there are many similarities, and we're definitely in the loving camp. <laughs> um, the um, <laughs> uh, is that um, I, mean, I was talking to colleagues this morning about this. In New Zealand, it's a very um, it's a very minister and portfolio centric system. So um, ministers are not, uh, in, a, in a legal or constitutional sense, the head of their departments. We have independent chief executives who are appointed by a state services commissioner and who are you know, accountable for the performance of and delivery of um, policy within their departments and um, delivery of outputs. The, the ministers determine the strategy and the policy and they are all co-located in, uh, in the Beehive, which is what we call um, our executive wing. And, um, and I think that it makes a kind of fundamental difference between, between you know, my, my colleagues here. Um, so it's, 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 a, it's a much more devolved system. And so what you end up with is chief executives being accountable and having mechanisms for ensuring that they are held accountable and responsible for delivery um, of, uh, of, of policy. Um, and, and that is kind of monitored in several ways. Uh, one of them is that we have a very, very strong cabinet system. And it always has been a, cabinet, a very strong cabinet system under you know, you know, successive governments have, have Prime Ministers have uh, found out a very useful mechanism for um, uh, either controlling or coordinating, depending on their style. And, um, and so that, by, that we use that mechanism for requiring reports back on how things are being implemented. So that's really heavily used for that. Every, you know, many cabinet minutes will say requiring a report back on how something is going, how something is being implemented. We also have a group called the Policy Advisory Group in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, um, which um, yours is 100, ours is 14, and um, because we do more with less. And, um, <laughs> and um, uh, so they, and, and they are looking out for issues, for looking out for lack of coordination, looking out for implementation issues and performance. And I was saying this morning that when they see that there is a problem, um, they do what they describe as wrapping a department within their loving embrace. Um, which you never want to happen to you. <laughs> um, and, and we'll be looking out there, the eyes and ears of the Prime Minister to coordinate and, and, um, and ensure things are done. So, um, so in terms of how things are determined strategically, we don't have a strategic uh, unit. And actually, there was a sort of experiment with it in the 1990s. It never worked. Ministers don't actually want it in New Zealand, I've found. They want to do the strategy themselves, and they do it at a political level, and they're supported by political advisors. We do have a cabinet strategy committee, which we sort of set up to support them in that process. It sometimes works, works well. Um, it, um, I, have, I don't feel we've quite found the key to make that work as well as it could. Um, but on the whole, strategy is managed uh, at, at the political level. Um, 
rather than at the, at the official level. The issues we have still have issues with cross-cutting uh, initiatives. We have a bit more flexibility than I think you have in the UK in terms of um, portfolios being supported. Uh, departments can support a number of ministers. Um, some of them have five or six ministers that they're reporting to on different things. Um, and that does create a little bit of, of a bit more flexibility than I think you might have here. But we still struggle with um, issues being siloed. So I don't think we've cracked that one either. Um, but quite a bit of work going on to try to do that. I won't go on too much if that's all right. I'll leave you to. That's perfect. We'll come back. Yep. OK, thank you very much. Um, I'm also very happy to be here in the Institute for Government. We're very jealous in the Netherlands of this institution. <laughs> but um, I'm afraid the level of taxation in the Netherlands is so high that we don't have any people left to fund <laughs> 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 these kind of institutions. So, uh, but it's very nice to be here. Um, <coughs> Well, uh, UK, you have started uh, experimenting on uh, coalition government since half a year. Well, we are very used to coalition government, but on the road to an even more exciting government, we now have a coalition minority government for the first time uh, since the Second World War, uh, with, which has uh, parliamentary support of uh, well, what, what the British press would call the, the maverick Mr. Wilders. Uh, he's a populist, uh, his populist party gives parliamentary support, but it's all a, less, a, more, a more or less fragile uh, construction. Uh, we don't have implementation units or polit political uh, uh, units or, or when the <coughs> government changes there's not a big switch in civil servants and he doesn't bring, the new prime minister doesn't bring any, a lot of uh, new political appointees uh, with him. Every minister in the Netherlands is entitled to one political assistant but that's more uh, some kind of lia liaison officer between the minister and the political party institutions, it's not a functioning government, so it's all civil servants. Uh, and implementation is, uh, is seen in the Netherlands as, as very, it has to be a tailor-made suit for the Prime Minister. So it's actually one of the first things we ask, uh, we discuss with the Prime Minister, how, uh, for, first of course, what goals do you want uh, to implement? But secondly, how do you want to follow? Uh, how, how do you want to follow, um, follow it up? Or how do you want to see what's, what's happening? Eh? I mean, luckily we don't elect our leaders uh, on the amount of numbers they can uh, understand, or uh, so some prime ministers want, they want graphs and they want statistics, and other prime ministers they, well, they want other things to make. They want more qualitative uh, assessments of uh, what's happening. So this is the first thing we ask. Uh, the, in the last government, we had 74 goals uh, in cabinet. I, I showed it this morning in our private function. This is the contract for the last government. It's 74 goals, it has milestones for each year, and it, uh, well, in the end, it, it was run, by the way, by three people in the cabinet office, so it was a very small, uh, very small unit. Uh, and, but but th there were two things wrong with it. Uh, it was perceived as, uh, well, too bureaucratic, and also the, the goals were made by the s different departments themselves. So uh, bringing peace and stability in the Middle East was one of them, uh, and it was green every year because the <laughs> targets the foreign office made for itself was be, were were achieved. achieved. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it, it gave it, it was a very damaging headlines in the newspaper where a cabinet on course says cabinet. <laughs> um, so in the end, it was put away as too bureaucratic and not uh, functional. Now we are, have changed to only 17 goals, which is actually still a bit much, I think, a bit many. Uh, but it's 17 goals. We, s we, have s we still use the, the milestones for each year, but we, t we are still in the process of formulating the milestones exactly, and we're trying to do it independently. So um, we, don't, uh, we, we don't ask the several departments to give us, uh, uh, well, we ask suggestions, of course, but we decide ourselves uh, how we're going to measure it up. Um, and but, the, um, but it's also uh, now more part of the treasury because of the, well, every country has contracting uh, uh, policies right now. All we also have to uh, make cutbacks for around 3 to 4% GDP in the Netherlands. Uh, so it's the delivery status is more now on a financial, uh, from a financial point of view, and it's based in the, in the treasury. Um, so basically, in the end, finally, I would say that we, in the center of government in the Netherlands, we don't try to win, uh, to win on information. The, the struggle with the departments because we realize in our center can never win on the information to, to the departments and we also don't want if the departments if they don't do their work properly then we don't want to create a new 
semi department in the center to redo all the work which should be done in the ministry so our center is uh, very small we use information from the departments if it's not sufficient or if we don't trust it we go outside the department or go external uh, and we make sure that the the rules of the rules of engagement i would call we were talking in war terms anyway um, we make sure that the rules are in favor of the government center so we decide when a minister should present stuff what he should present etc and we accept that information uh, that the, the departments are better on the information anyway great well that's been a fantastic brief overview and chris if you'd like to sort of <laughs> talk about what you're trying to do and, and how that relates compared to contrast Sure, absolutely. Um, I mean, it's been a fascinating day from my point of view, just hearing the experience in, in different but similar in, in, in many ways um, uh, government systems. And I think my, my overall conclusion is that um, I'm pretty confident there isn't a right way of doing this. I think as you look, you know, small centre, autonomy for departments, great on ownership, you know, less good on, on, on kind of uh, detailed control and information, big centre can feel bureaucratic, you know. So I think as we've looked at some of the pluses and minuses of each of the systems we're currently using, I think you quickly realise that, that there isn't one correct way. Um, I have one great advantage, which is, uh, unlike uh, the other countries represented here, you know what's going on in the UK, so I won't spend any time kind of talking you through um, the, 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 the systems we use, because I think you're, you're all well aware of them. Um, I'll just pick out um, uh, four uh, quick uh, highlights, I suppose, for me, of the change that has occurred over the last year. And I think the level of both structural, cultural, philosophical, if you like, change around how the government is running since the election is, is, um, is pretty dramatic, actually. Um, the, the first thing to say uh, is that we've seen a, a, a huge shift in terms of what the government wants to measure and focus on. We've moved away from outcomes and outputs um, to a government who wants to focus on inputs. Um, what, what does that mean practically? It means that they want to monitor things that they believe are 100% within their control. So actually, rather than we will achieve peace in the Middle East, we will pass a piece of legislation to allow X to happen something that is completely in their control. So out go PSAEs, out go targets, in have come business plans, which are completely focused on actions. What will this department, this Secretary of State be doing month by month? Um, it is a very different philosophy. It is one that says, um, if we do these things, we believe good things will happen. If you talk to Michael Gove in education, he believes that allowing parents more choice allowing schools to have more autonomy, whether that be in an academy or as a free school or as a university technical college, he believes that will drive up education standards. It's a very different approach from one which says, let's measure uh, reading results for seven-year-olds. So I think we've seen a massive shift in terms of, of what uh, the, the center is, is playing a role on. Um, I think the second thing is, obviously, um, it, it is a coalition. Uh, fantastically useful for me uh, talking to particularly Netherlands and, and, and uh, Canada today about their experiences. We are so new at this and I think it has had a number of implications. Uh, number one, I think the focus that the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister have put on implementation is much higher. Um, you know, we have never had a kind of implementation head being based in number 10 before. And I think that comes from uh, the coalition is based on a coalition agreement, which they take very seriously. There are, uh, I'm not sure Emma will tell me here, 352 commitments, something like that. Um, and they believe that the coalition has a, a very real responsibility to deliver on each and every one of those. So the degree of new policy generation that is going on is still huge, but it is, needs to be balanced with implementation. So we've created in number 10, instead of what would have been a policy unit and an external delivery unit, a policy and implementation unit, and very much the new team that, that uh, uh, I've created there, their job is split between the two. It is generating new policy, tweaking policy, um, but it is also very much reporting to the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister very regularly on, and how is it going um, in terms of, of, of actually uh, delivering on the ground. I think you also see that playing out in the degree to which uh, cabinet government has, has returned here. Um, obviously a vital uh, element of a coalition and making sure that all the voices are heard. So I think that would be the second element, coalition. Um, third element um, would be around transparency. I mean, really lively debates between us <laughs> earlier today about the... <laughs> 
I, I won't embarrass the person by saying who it was, but someone said, transparency, you guys have got nutty on it. And it is that kind of level. The level of transparency that this government is trying to achieve is, is uh, huge. It's um, basically all the other countries. Thanks, <laughs> 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 Dan. <laughs> Um, you know, within a, a few months of coming in, you know, every senior Whitehall uh, uh, person's salary was online. You could see exactly who was doing which job, how many staff they had, what local authorities were spending down to £500. I'm sure in the room there'll be very different views on whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but certainly the government believed that actually the greater the transparency, the greater the public accountability for their implementation. They would have more data on which to judge them and more ability to feed back. Um, red tape challenge, which I don't know any, how many of you have clocked at the moment, a, a, a very good example of this. Rather than saying, let's consult on what regulation to remove, they're consulting on, if you don't fight for it, it's all going. So there's a very different engagement in terms of the level of transparency, and I think that is shifting how the centre has been operating. And I suppose the fourth one, um, which, which is a bit more uh, 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 subjective, is just the interaction between number 10 <laughs> and Treasury. Um, again, different models across the different countries on how that spending, Treasury, fiscal control um, integrates with strategy and implementation. I think we have uh, a great advantage at the moment, and I think if you talk around Whitehall, I hear this all the time, you know, the, the Chancellor and the Prime Minister are very close. And what that has meant is that actually, from an implementation point of view, you know, business plans, no line in the business plan is there unless it's already funded. It's that simple. Treasury and Number 10 have sort of been as one voice. If you look at the back of the plan in terms of what are the indicators that we are monitoring, um, there are uh, policy reform ones in there, but there are also financial ones. So I think, again, um, that level of integration between uh, implementation and the overall fiscal uh, situation has increased somewhat. So I think those are, are, are sort of four themes that I would pick out that sort of signify the changes that have, have happened over the last year. Um, but obviously, we're happy to, to delve into wherever anyone's interested in. Great. Well, with every question, I'll take them sort of three at a time, <coughs> and then please then everybody feel they need to comment on every question. <laughs> and if you pick out something where you've got something where you're actually finding interesting, um, yeah. And if you could say who you are and where you're from. Uh, I guess it's a question for uh, number 10. But um, the changes that were made over the last decades were quite substantial in terms of the structure of number 10. It's become a lot more political than it used to ever be. And I was wondering how you think the advice from the civil service now interacts with advice from special advisors and how that makes a difference in terms of long-term planning. Sure. And that's it. Um, hi, I'm Adam Sharples from DWP, Department of Pensions. Um, Chris gave what I thought was the clearest account of the shift in government away from looking at outcomes and outputs to focusing on inputs. And I just wondered whether you might see some risks there with uh, shifting a culture in government towards uh, fulfilling commitments to activity rather than necessarily asking whether that activity is producing results. And I, I hope that we approach this with a degree of balance between the two and not lose sight of the, the outcomes. Uh, Emma Kenny, I work with Chris Moran in number 10. I actually had a question for Ben of a less philosophical nature, but you mentioned that there are at any one time about 30 policies under review by your team. I'd be really interested if you, if you could tell us a bit about the mechanism for how you identify which policies need that close monitoring. Good. Um, so where do we start with you, Chris, because it seemed to be um, the first one. Sure. Um, yes, and I'll, I mean, I'll t touch on both quickly. Uh, number 10, political versus civil servant. I mean, we have a fascinating situation at the moment, which is my new policy and implementation unit is solely civil servants. It has never been ha done before. It was a very practical reason, which was you either had to have two units, uh, a deputy prime minister and a prime minister, to deal with both political parties, um, which actually just felt a bit inefficient actually. No, no great reason beyond that, actually. Did we really need to double hat everything? Or you needed people who could offer advice to both impartial 
of their own political preferences. Um, it hasn't been done before. It is a trial. Um, it will be very interesting to see how it's how it works. So far, so good, and I think it has, um, you know, some 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 great advantages in that you are depoliticizing some of the analysis in terms of policy development and implementation, and just looking at it from hopefully an evidence an evidence based point of view. Um, inputs and outputs. Look, I, I, I as uh, some I recognise in, in the room, uh, I was an associate in the uh, delivery unit under Michael Barber. So um, I, uh, I think there is there is obviously a case for focusing on, you know, some ultimate output. Um, you know, if you're looking at crime, I can sit there with Theresa May and go through and say, right, here are the actions. But if crime is overall going up, then that would not be a good thing. Um, I think the difference is not saying that outputs don't matter, because ultimately they do. It's, it's how you get at them. So the government would say, of course outputs matter, and that's what the public will judge us on. We should give them all the data, and they will ultimately vote. Um, we will give them the right to elect their local police commissioner, and they will say, if they're not doing a good job, they'll get rid of them. So I think it's not removing the responsibility. Clearly, government is about providing you know, services and outputs for the people that pay for it. But I think it's about what are the mechanisms you use to do that. The business plans are very input-based, uh, but they track at the back uh, half in the indicators the overall uh, outputs. It just doesn't try and targetize things that the government believes it can't control, you know, like Middle East yeah. peace. I agree, I agree very much with uh, Chris here. Thanks. I mean, <laughs> output, output measures are, of course, very necessary, but I have spoken with a lot of uh, uh, civil servants from line ministries who always want to focus on output. But when I ask the input questions about uh, but how much does it cost and how many civil servants do you need, I mean, if you don't have these input questions too, you, you're, you don't understand the policies either. You, you have to have both. It's not a, a question of if, if, but you need both. Just to follow up, I think Ben to respond to the last question. Just, and it's, I'd be particularly interested also in, in the, the question about political advisors mm -hmm. versus civil servant mm -hmm. advisors and how those relationships work in, in some of the other. Well, we, we didn't used to have um, political advisors at all in New Zealand, but what happened, what, but we do happen now, and, um, and it's because of um, adopting proportional representation and having. Uh, coalition um, regimes and so um, <laughs> and so what that meant was that because there was always an ongoing process of negotiation between the, we, I mean we, we haven't gone for um, big comprehensive coalition documents we've gone increasingly towards much more flexible um, kind of relationship based support agreements that say we will work together in good faith and with no surprises and here are sort of five key things but um, for the rest of it, we'll negotiate as we go, and so they're always negotiating on support for legislation and so on, even with the ministers, because in the New Zealand context, with this, the ministers we have now are not obliged to support all, the support party ministers are not obliged to support all measures, so government measures, so they have to negotiate everything, and that means you had to have political advisors in the offices, because otherwise public servants would have been, civil servants would have been doing that political ne negotiation. And on the whole, people have found that a useful development, and on the whole, they have managed to work well with the departments. See, you know, bearing in mind that the ministers are all together with their political advisors, and you've got the departments located separately. But they they manage to they manage to work out those relationships. Um, we've got a, quite a lot of um, guidance around how they should work in the cabinet manual, and 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 I think it's actually been pretty successful. Every now and then, you'll get political advisors who are very protective of the ministers or gatekeepers, or they overstep the bounds. But that's been the exception, not the rule. And in our system, we have political advisors for ministers and for the prime minister. So I have a group of about 20 that advise from the public service side. He has an equivalent group, give or take, who will who join with him and will leave with him at the end uh, at the end of his ministry. And in talking to a, uh, especially younger public servants in Canada, one of the things that strikes me is that we've got to really validate the importance of what we're in, what we're in here. And what we're in here is ultimately reliant on the democratic will. And politics is seen as a bad thing. And I think actually, I've been in the room where where I'm saying to ministers. I actually can't give you that advice. I should not give you that advice. I'm not, I'm not deeply embedded in the party. I maybe bring, I hope I bring some different value out of it, a certain memory of how things have worked out in the past, a certain sense of how things are going. They bring, and it's very important for us to remember a daily experience every Sunday afternoon at tea all across Canada with ordinary Canadians hearing things. And sometimes that intelligence is hugely important to what we need to be responding to. Because our polls would have picked up on it about six months after the tidal wave engulfed Ottawa, 
from something that's happening out there. We've experienced that. So we need to, I think we need to find that balance. It's a very important, and, and at the most senior level, very important job policing the swim lanes. So to make sure that they are getting the policy advice that they need and unvarnished policy advice. And if it's not politically sensitive, then it's just lobbying. So I think part of my job is to pay attention to how things are likely to work out from a political perspective. But they also need separately, and we believe very strongly in trying to reinforce the importance of bringing a political perspective to it. And that's really what they're on about. And the combination of those two things, we think, leads to better policy. You've got to be vigorous and courageous in defending those swim lanes, and you've got to be ready to resign. Right? That's fundamentally the key for me is, is to know that I, can, I, I should be ready to walk out the door at any time if I'm being asked to do something that I think is just so fundamentally wrong that in my professional advice I can't live with it. Short of that, or if I'm being asked to play a political role and I'm not, uh, that's not appropriate, you've got to have the mechanisms to protect those swim lanes. But we think it, we think we get better governance by having that that combination. Ben, you want to address Sure. Uh, very, very briefly, we uh, we uh, sit down, give or take, with the prime minister um, uh, on a number of occasions during the kind of the the, the cycle of parliament. Uh, in, in the most recent case, uh, we had an election in August last year uh, that produced the government in September last year. Uh, that was an interesting time. Um, and uh, we sat down with the Prime Minister effectively in, uh, in October and November and worked with her about, about the priorities that she wanted to push forward. And that then led into two separate uh, um, cabinet discussions about what cabinet thought their priorities should be, uh, which um, uh, was largely um, uh, kind of uh, worked up uh, in advance and kind of driven by the Prime Minister. Um, and so from there, we effectively just manage and monitor those on, on her behalf. And um, from time to time, there's cause to change. You know, if something, uh, something new comes up or something slips off the agenda or something um, uh, ends in uh, resounding success and therefore, you know, it's no longer a priority because it's been done or, or those kinds of things. And so that's a, an ongoing process of managing the priorities. Um, uh, and I mean, the, the one thing I would say about that is, um, there's this danger of uh, comprehensivity. Comprehensive, is that a word? Uh, yeah, uh, in, the, in the sense that, um, you know, when you get into a cabinet discussion about priorities, you know, um, I'm tempted to say every child uh, wins a prize, but then that might um, make people think that our ministers are children, which of course I don't. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but you do get into this zone where, you know, there has to be something for most people, if not everyone. And so you get a, a large number of priorities. And at the end of the day, strategy is about the choice not to do something as much as it is about the choice to do something. And so it's quite difficult to run a, a democratic cabinet process that produces a very strategic outcome, if I can put it in those terms. Great, we've got three already. So um, first, this gentleman here. George Jones, OFC. Although you're all serving your prime ministers, and this is a question to all of you. Are you serving your Prime Minister as the Chairman of the Cabinet in order to sustain collective processes and not really interfere too much in departments? Or are you serving your Prime Minister as an actor with his own specific policy priorities, which might take you into intervening in the departments. I'd like to know which of those roles you feel you're performing. Great, thank you. Right at the back. Uh, John McTurnan. John McTurnan, I'm currently writing for the Daily Telegraph, but I was previously the Director of Political Operations for Tony Blair, and I was the um, Head of Policy for the Scottish Government in 2001. Um, my question's really about reality which is that, in my experience, all plans collapse on encounter with external circumstances. And to what extent do any governments uh, engage in actually aiming through the consequences of policies, not just in comms terms, which I think most people think about but do incredibly badly, but actually in system terms? Uh, what will what will this actually do if it runs through the system? Uh, because I think 
I can think of Labour Party policy failures, and I can think of uh, federal Australian policy failures, and I can think of banned topics which might be considered difficult for the current government. What would that be? Brilliant, thank you. And then this one here, and then we'll do another round. Thank you. Alastair Levy from McKinsey & Company. Uh, a number of the panelists referred to the imperative governments around the world are facing to improve their productivity and, and, and efficiency. Um, Chris commented on the changing role of the centre in the UK. It would be very interest interesting to hear perspectives on how the role of the centre in your countries has changed or you think might change or should change given the likely increasing focus on governments on issues of productivity. Questions. Who wants to start? Start with George. Well, I'd, I'd be willing to talk about that in terms of the capacity in which I'm supporting the Prime Minister. And I, I, I think there's a bit of. Mostly, I think the department of which the cabinet offices are semi-autonomous units. Too complicated to explain. But I think mostly the department is supporting the Prime Minister as chair of cabinet. But there are certainly some aspects of his own personal priorities where we also support him independently. Um, so mostly one, but a little bit of the other. I don't know. You get other perspectives on that. Yeah. I, I guess, I mean, for me, I, I, can't, I can't make the distinction. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't think uh, it's realistic to see a Prime Minister as somehow a kind of an empty vessel the Cabinet fills up. Uh, of, of course, any Prime Minister comes to the job with, with leadership, with priorities, with personal perspectives, uh, sometimes uh, on very small things, actually, uh, and sometimes on very large things. And uh, of course, there's conflict within Cabinet, and of course, the Prime Minister has to take a, uh, a role in that and a view on that. And sometimes that means that uh, the Prime Minister might not trust the work that comes out of a particular department, uh, although that very rarely happens in, in Australia, and certainly not at the moment. Um, uh, but, but you know, this is the reality of, of life as chair of, uh, as chair of cabinet in an environment which is very profoundly different from uh, uh, the prime minister as CEO in a kind of a corporate analogy. I mean, I, I think I don't think that analogy works uh, very much at all. So I, I can't distinguish the roles. Yeah. yeah, I have three quick answers. I see myself as a, definitely for an actor in a specific role as Prime Minister. I have colleagues who do the collective part, but uh, l like uh, cabinet issue and, and, and notes of the meetings, etc. But I do specifically, uh, I'm his messenger to the Treasury and to Social Security uh, Office. Secondly, reality versus external uh, circumstances. I actually think that the delivery helps to keep cabinet uh, think uh, past events. I mean, events, they can temporarily uh, put the cabinet off track, but the system of delivery within uh, the civil service is going on. So in a few months, they will be uh, led away and they see the next uh, progress uh, file or the next report. <coughs> and then they are confronted with the fact that the ideas they had a year ago uh, are moving away. And then, of course, prime minister can decide, okay, well, priorities from last year are not my priorities anymore. But then he has to make the decision himself. So he is, he is confronted with it. So actually, I think the um, delivery uh, system, uh, system uh, is actually helping. Let me go on to the next one. And we'll, let, we'll do them one, one at a time. So, um, OK. Is there, uh, uh, William, do you want to say uh, first? I would have difficulty drawing the distinction as well in the sense that the Prime Minister is responsible for the care and nurturing of his ministry and for the success of his ministry. And his success as Prime Minister will be determined not by what he does himself, but by the success of his ministry. So there's that. Having said that, we talked this morning of the danger of the centre taking on and doing too many things. But I have a very interesting job, but fundamentally don't do much at the end of the day that affects <laughs> real people directly. You've got to remember that. It's very important from the centre to remember it, that taking on things takes away the talent function that I'm supposed to play in the system. Uh, yeah. On the other hand, sometimes getting directly involved in carrying out a, a sort of a, a prime ministerial prim uh, priority, whether directly or by reaching into departments, is an important uh, an important part of this. And I, I think part of it as well is to organize the ministry to rescue folks when things are overwhelming them or when they're they're off the rails. And we can help. And that's where the the loving embrace kind of thing comes in. Sometimes it's experienced as that, and sometimes not. Uh, but the center will reach in, and the sort of the cold hand will reach you. Uh, <laughs> One way or the other. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do, do we want to move on to the 
the second question, John's question from the back, sure. like, you know, do we actually think of like how these things are going to play through our system rather than just their common consequences? Um, does anybody want to pitch in on that? Okay. Why don't I have a have a go? Um, uh, I think there are there are. Uh, like w with any uh, government, there are goods and bads on this. I think you know what this government is applying. I think very effectively, particularly to that point, is pilots and payment by results, where you say, look, actually, let's try, let's see, and we will pay if the results come in as we want, and if they don't, then we won't, and it won't have cost the uh, the, the taxpayer a disproportionate amount. So actually, I think there are some effective mechanisms that this government is using that haven't been used before, which in a sense are allowing scenarios to be trialled out at relatively uh, minimal, minimal cost. Um, uh, you know, clearly, I, I, I can't uh, not mention the NHS today, it would seem a bit strange really. Of course, there are scenarios uh, where not enough is done, and I think that isn't a party uh, political comment. I think you could go back over the last 15 years and, and pick, you know, a number of policies. I think, you know, interestingly, it's a combination of uh, the policies itself, the structures that are put in place, like what information, was the right information available at the right time, was enough scenario planning done. Sometimes it comes down to really simple human factors where, you know, uh, right people weren't in right roles or right communication didn't happen between them. So should government do more? Yes, absolutely, is the short answer. <laughs> uh, just very, very briefly, I think it's a very good question and, and my experience is that uh, uh, generally that approach, that mindset is poorly done in, in most governments and on most policy issues. Uh, so I think uh, the exception uh, is where it's done well rather than the alternative and, uh, and, and I mean I find in our context that one of the most frequent questions that I ask or the, the frequent kind of directions I go is, well, but, but what about the alternative scenarios? What happens if it doesn't play out the way it does? What, what options does this course of action create for you in two, three or five year t years' time? And that's, um, uh, th there, aren't, um, there aren't many incentives in the system to, to think like that and to, and to question like that. And uh, so as a result, most cabinet, um, most cabinet processes are very linear in nature and they kind of say, well, first we're going to do legislation and then we're going to do this and then we're going to do that and you know and then we'll come back and think about what to do next and so that kind of dy dynamic systems thinking is not very not very common it is, it's the same in New Zealand um, I think we could do better there and some are really interested in looking at that but once you've done something you've implemented it and you've moved on and you're not looking back and seeing well how's it how's it all playing out and it's really relevant at the moment when we're thinking about well what can you stop doing um, and, and people having a really system. So it's, that is actually forcing people to have a systematic look at what they've already done to see what they can stop doing. I think it's just quickly, it's in the nature of government to act. Mm -hmm. Government in stasis is almost unimaginable and won't stay that long for. And sometimes you're acting on things you want to be acting on and you've thought through and you've actually, whether rightly or wrongly, based on the information available, you've gamed it out and tried to understand it. Uh, you have experienced that uh, you're often reacting to events that are poorly understood, manifest themselves. The first report's wrong, the second report's less wrong, and over time, if you can if you can stage it out, you might react less badly than you otherwise would on on the first uh, on the first report in. But in any government, you're balancing those things you want to do, and hopefully you've thought about them well, and you can have systems and processes that make that more likely. And you're also reacting to things sometimes uh, things that you don't have enough time to to really understand. And the hardest thing of all is to admit for, for uh, our political leaders and for senior public servants that there's a lot of things you just don't understand. Yeah. Uh, and you've got to act there whether you understand them fully or not mm. uh, in some respects as well. Great. Can we just move quickly on to the third question, which is how is the, the ever-increasing demand for productivity um, going to change the way centres need to operate? I guess a couple of things. One is we're launching a comprehensive review of government programs. We've done it. We've done it for three years. We're going to do it all again in terms of an efficiency review in the, in the next year, and that's an additional burden on the system that, that the centre's got to drive because it's the only way of making it effective is to make sure that you're meeting a certain set of standards and goals uh, in terms of the process by which you're doing the analysis and not leaving to departments to declare victory each one after the other and uh, and do that. But there is that. Uh, I think that the center as an enabler uh, of innovation is something that we need to think through. 
we can stifle the risk in 12 ways from Sunday if we want. I can, I can create more committees and processes and structures and reports uh, in terms of uh, taking away risk taking in the system. Enabling risk taking and creating a safe space, a depoliticized space in some circumstances, a highly political space in some circumstances where risks can be taken and innovation can happen is something that I think we're, we're still trapped with, uh, with a little bit too much of an across the board model in terms of, uh, of governance and systems and, and risk control. So I think we need to become a bit more adaptive there. And we need to find ways of, of validating and celebrating uh, quick response. Right, wrong, or indifference, nimbleness is something we, we are not heavily enough invested in. And we need to do more, I think, to try to create structures where we will, we will celebrate uh, nimbleness uh, as, a policy, uh, as a policy tool. Okay, next round, so, yeah. Uh, John T. Olive Cooper from A4E. Um, I, I, I wondered how you get the right experience for your roles. So you up there, and actually I think everybody here, we're all working age, white, non-criminal, uh, savers, <laughs> well-educated. I've got a better view. <laughs> <laughs> and, and typically people are trying to help, um, they are not those things very often. Um, so how do you, that presumably is more acute problem the more you spend time in a very centralized, highly pressured role like the kinds you perform. And I suppose the second part is how do you ensure that you remain, that there's a space at the center for system change because uh, we know that some of the most acute problems are ones that are cross-cutting fall in many departments where there's many interventions required. And, and we also know even if we dealt with that, that we tend to deal with problems once they've occurred and not upstream spending the small amounts of money to prevent them. Um, picking up on Adam's question. So how do we avoid we don't become overly focused on a checklist and really rigorous implementation within a system that is basically not that great? Because surely changing the system probably has to come from some central or not just a ministerial silo uh, function. Robert Hazel from the Constitution Unit and senior fellow here at the Institute. My question is about new governments. Some of you are working for new governments, and you will, since you've all got long experience, seen new governments take up office. What are the classic things that new governments get wrong in their <laughs> first year in terms of the configuration and the operation of the center? Excellent. And then there was one at the back. Thanks. Um, Sean Lusk, National School of Government. Uh, I'm sort of coming back to this issue that, that Adam uh, raised and, and John uh, as well about outcomes and, and it's not specifically for Chris but perhaps for, for some of the other panel members as well. Um, I suppose I've got two concerns which may have been observed, certainly Canada's very well known for results-based management, yes, so I'm very concerned about ultimate outcomes and understanding that measurement. Um, I suppose one concern is how would we do payment by results if we're not interested in the outcome because actually the result is, is the outcome rather than merely the the intermediate output. And, uh, and the other one is more of a cultural question because, in a sense, you know, administrators, bureaucrats, civil servants are, very, are, are on the whole very interested in inputs. I take uh, Dan's point about you've got to understand the relationship between inputs and outputs and outcomes. But if we're not interested enough in outcomes, will civil servants just snap back to the activity and not really think about whether the activity is having the effect we really want? Was there just one, because I think it's maybe the last round, but there was one. Hi, Justine Zim from the Institute for Government. Um, I just wanted to touch back on the sort of the peace in the Middle East example, <laughs> and I uh, quite like the panel's reflections on how you balance the sort of allowing departments and ministers to set their own exam questions versus having too much central control in the sort of Australian. Um, automatic weapons sort of you can do too much <laughs> um, so, so it'd be good to get I'm giving the wrong input <laughs> 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 unfortunately it's, it's undermining all of our stereotypes <laughs> <laughs> okay so the first question which was John to who wants to pick up on that I mean, I mean, that background one, um, I, I think it's very simple actually I think you need to be out in the real world 
and I think I feel that very strongly. Um, I do not have a typical background for someone doing this type of role. I think that is hugely helpful. I talk to mums at the school gate when I drop my kids off and hear, you know, what they're, you know, excuse the language, pissed off about. Um, I <laughs> go back to my private sector background and, and have lots of conversations there with, with uh, you know, people from industry that I wouldn't have. So I think a diverse background of whatever type is hugely helpful. And certainly for us, rotating folk into the center and out of the center, there's a few specialized areas where machinery, the dark box of how government is formed or whatever, and senior personnel, those that are selected and how they're paid. There, there are some areas where you need longer, longer term folk with, with a greater memory, but in the analysts and the kind of government, we're trying to pull people from, from government, let them see how the center works and then punt them back into, the, into government as well. And I, I think in terms of background and awareness of what's going on in, uh, out, in, out in the real world, it's very important for us to acknowledge that, um, that we need to be reaching out through departments and we need to be reaching out and listening to ministers and doing other things to try to, try to get that experience because it's not something we have. And in the hothouse you live in, it's, it's a mistake to think that you, you know too much in that case. Okay, um, shall we move on to the question of new government? The <laughs> <laughs> um, I've, I've uh, um, now seen uh, three changes of prime ministers uh, in, during my civil service uh, life. And um, the, the, the main thing which you actually can do wrong in the beginning is actually getting the wrong kind of ministers <laughs> <laughs> in your team. We get to choose I, that. I, <laughs> I didn't realize No, but he's, but he's <laughs> asking what could the center of government do? <laughs> Um, I think I quote Clement Attlee when I say, uh, when talking about ministers who are not up to the job. <laughs> I think that you re uh, pr future prime ministers, th th before the election, they think too few moments about what kind of team they're going to play with. It's immensely important. It's immensely important to get, bec what, you, what you said, there is no right system. The system has to, f the, the delivery system or implementation system or whatever, it has to fit the team of people who are sitting, who are taking up the job. So you have to think about it. Then a very important thing also is the portfolio. Uh, if you think something, if, if really something is uh, your target, uh, like for, in, and, and especially when it's like a horizontal cross-cutting one, like youth uh, policies or like uh, <laughs> uh, uh, n uh, old neighborhoods, reconstruction areas, uh, then, in our country, a successful policy has been to implement in the beginning already a new minister without portfolio, especially for that um, uh, issue. But we don't want all kinds of departmental reorganizations because it takes a lot of time and energy for the wrong time. So, uh, but we do give him a budget. That's what we talked about this morning too. It's essential that some, this kind of minister without portfolio gets his own budget because if there is a budget, ideas and civil servants will follow. It's just the way civil servants uh, work. So, um, but you really have to think about it. And I think prime ministers, especially during election time, et cetera, they, are, they don't spend enough time. It's of, of course explicable, but they should think about more about how would they organize their, uh, their targets. Can I take that, uh, that useful comment one step further and say, uh, certainly in the Australian context, uh, it's sometimes observed that governments don't make the transition fast enough from being an opposition <coughs> to being a government. Uh, and um, as a result, uh, the, um, the, the mindset around the leader uh, is very agile, very fast and furious, very, you know, what are we going to get in the media tomorrow? Uh, it's very personality based in terms of human capital and uh, it doesn't sometimes make the transition into, into a kind of a systematized approach to delivering through the mechanisms, the, the kind of the hard power of, of control of the levers of government. Uh, and, and that's certainly something that has had quite a lot of attention recently in Australia because um, there've been, uh, without going into details, there've been some transitions that have been better on that front than others. <laughs> and, um, and one state government in particular at the moment that uh, uh, has um, uh, had had a transition some time ago, but has still not effectively made the transition out of opposition uh, mm -hmm. uh, opposition mode. Um, so, you know, th that's an interesting aspect of it. 
We, we had quite the opposite, where um, they were absolutely ready to go. And we had a situation where this ad, uh, administration came in, the national led administration, and were from day one, they had a 100 day program, it was totally set out, it was just absolutely full on and just about killed everybody. Um, and I'm sure there would have been public servants all around the place in New Zealand saying it was wrong because they didn't want our advice and they didn't seek, you know, it wasn't, didn't, wasn't coming from us and, um, and uh, it could have been better and it had all these ridiculous results. And, but the point is they had the mandate to do it and mm. done all the thinking mm. and they were ready to come yeah, in and they weren't going to yeah. sit around waiting to be given different advice from mm. an official. So, but one thing, so, you know, I reckon that was you know, absolutely their, their right to do it. One thing that is sometimes a bit tricky with any new administration, this is my fourth prime minister, is that um, sometimes there's a branding thing they want to get away from and actually it's perfectly kind of sensible word, but you're not allowed to use it anymore <laughs> because it's all going to be eliminated from everybody's, you know, you know, documents because nobody's allowed to say <laughs> ability or, you know, because it was the other people's brand or, you know, so um, sometimes that can just be, you know. Can, can, <laughs> okay. can, can, yeah, can I just <laughs> can I just give another uh, small anecdotal uh, story about? I, I was just asked by one of the ministers. He he didn't feel happy, and he said, "Well, what what am I doing wrong?" And he he just made the transition from a backbench MP to being a minister. And uh, I I took the liberty, being blunt uh, as we are used to in the <laughs> Netherlands, to say to him, "Well, as a MP, you just you sh when you shoot ten times." Uh, if you hit five times, then you're a good MP. And even if you're, if you, you hit seven times, then you're a very good MP. But if you're a minister and you shoot 10 times and you miss three times, people are going to ask, is, is his judgment right? Is, is he okay? Is it a sound figure? So you, it's really, it's different roles. So, uh, and you have to prepare for that. It's, this, it's not the thing you can just switch in a day. And that's why you have to think about it. Right, if we could just turn attention to the questions on the actual government. Mm -hmm. okay. um, uh, yeah, can I, I, th I think um, uh, th that there is a bit of misunderstanding about this. It is not that outcomes are wrong. Clearly, any government will not be re-elected if it doesn't deliver outcomes. So, I th And I think Whitehall has slightly misunderstood that. I'm not saying you have personally, but just generally there is this thing. What I said at the beginning was, as a monitoring tool, should you have targets around specific outcomes for which you do not control all the levers. You know, I remember working on uh, you know, A&E waiting times. Actually, by and large, you had most of the levers to control that, so very effectively, it was a target that we could make progress on. If you are trying to make targets um, th uh, where government controls only a very few of the levers, then this government believes that's not effective. So the, the process they are using to monitor and report what they are spending their time doing is an input-based process. That does not mean that they don't care about outputs, they just don't believe in targetizing particular things. Um, you mentioned payment by results. Clearly, you know, if you're letting a contract, and as, as Adam well knows from you know, Work Program and other uh, examples of this, the, the, the contract has to be incredibly clear on what, we, what outcomes will you pay for. So that's a very good example where outcomes are, you know, the entire thing is structured around what is the result you are looking for. Um, and so it's not that they're anti outputs or outcomes, whichever way you want to call it, it's just in terms of as a monitoring tool, that is not what they choose to do. They believe that the public will hold them to account for those outcomes. On a payment by result basis, you'll be able to look at the, the results and pay on the base of those outcomes. But it's very different from having as, a, as the role of the center promising that you will deliver that outcome. That's the bit they react to. So I don't know if that, that clarifies it. I think just as the only politician on the panel, just on that point, <laughs> I think it's an interesting point. I guess that what we would say is that we're the ones who are permanently every week, every weekend, brought in touch with whether the outcomes are improving or not. And you can get into a situation where, and I've used crime figures as a classic example, where a government that is pursuing what it thinks are the outcome measures of crime rate can be completely out of touch with actually what matters, which is what people think is going on. Mm -hmm. And we politicians therefore would rather that we take responsibility for working out whether the outcomes are improving enough to get us re-elected. What yeah. we want the, the, the civil servants to be doing is actually delivering the policies that we were elected to deliver. And then if, if they don't work, if they don't improve the state of Britain, we'll be turned back. And then you'll have to work with somebody else. 
But you, I, I really agree again with this story. You can also look at it from the other side. What if you, there's a clear relation between crime figures and e economic growth? If hmm. crime g goes down because economy grows, then your outcome is great, but it does not have anything to do with what your ministry has done or whatever uh, input uh, stuff is going inside. So, I mean, outcome is not enough. It can't be uh, uh, that you only have your targets on outcome. And then finally, just the, the, the question from Justine, um, which was, I guess, mainly for Chris, but, but, but probably for others. D d department autonomy. And writing your own report, you know, your yeah. own exam. Um, Look, you know, the, the, the idea of an input-based monitoring system was, was there very much, uh, at least in the Conservative camp as they came into, uh, uh, into the coalition. Um, did that mean, I would love to think that I could have sat down with the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister and said, tell me what you want to write in, uh, in the education plan, and Michael Gove would just have taken that. It would have made my life a hell of a lot easier. Um, unfortunately, it would have no ownership and no chance of it actually happening. Um, it, it's a fine balance. You know, departments have to own their plan. They, they wrote their plan. Uh, they wrote their priorities. Uh, now, clearly, uh, the centre has to agree with that. We have to look and say, well, does that, you know, what, what uh, health is saying on health visitors and, and baby provision fit with early years education policy and with, uh, you know, uh, welfare policies for working parents? You know, does that stack up? Um, but it has to be a balance. So, yes, we have to coordinate. We have to make sure that it does represent what the Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister want, what the coalition agreement you know, articulated, but the Secretaries of State have to own their plan, and that was, that's the nego negotiation you go through. Um, uh, and you have to end up with something that Treasury, Number 10, and the Department both own to at least a good enough level that you can work to it. Yeah. Okay, if there isn't a burning other question or comment, then thanks to Ben, Chris, and Rebecca, and William, very much indeed, and thanks to the LSE, um, and the IFG for putting on this event. And most importantly, I believe, am I right, Kerry, there are drinks outside. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>